Can a doll heal a city's wounds? In the summer of 1965, Black LA's long simmering frustrations over police violence and economic deprivation boiled over. Six days of civil unrest resulted in 34 deaths, more than 1,000 injuries, and $40 million in property destruction. The problems that sparked the Watts Rebellion and the problems left in its wake were profound. How could the community move forward? One little doll suggested a possibility. Manufactured in the heart of South Los Angeles by a company called Shindana, it encouraged both racial understanding and community empowerment. And in the process, it forever changed the American toy industry. LA is an idea as much as a city, a landscape of aspirations and imaginations. But behind the idea of LA are the stories of people, dreamers seeking fortune or reinvention, and those who saw the dream as an illusion. So let's uncover clues to a forgotten past in the archives. Lost LA explores the untold history behind the fantasy of California. Lost LA is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropy, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, and the California State Library. I'd never heard the story of Shindana Toys until a friend told me about this remarkable company. I wanted to learn more, so I met up with doll collector Billy Green. Thank you for coming. Come on in. I have this doll I really want to show you. This is Baby Nancy. Baby Nancy? Yes, and she was one of the first dolls that Shindana made back in 1968. She was made right here in Los Angeles, and she changed the American toy industry. Amazing. You have more like Baby Nancy? I do, I do. Come on, follow me. Wow, so you are a collector. Oh, yes. <laughs> the Barbie doll that they made was called Career Wanda. Uh. And this is Wanda the Skydiver. Oh, amazing. Yes. <laughs> See, she has a parachute she back here. She has a parachute. <laughs> so this is Wanda the Skydiver. Uh, there was also Wanda the Nurse. And this is her little booklet. That's her little booklet. You so she could be a, a TWA uh, flight attendant. Actually, that was a real person. Oh, these are these all? These are all real people that they actually made the dolls after. A little girl would get this doll, and this booklet would tell them about the doll and, and also the person. suggest all these different careers. You yes, be a nurse or a ballerina. Oh. So the idea was to show young women that they could do anything. That's why Shandana was really important. And here's also a catalog from uh, 1977. Every year they came out with a catalog of all of their different dolls. So did you buy these dolls for your kids? Yes, I did. Oh, There's okay. one called the uh, Walker that's in there, and my youngest daughter received her when she was like four or five years old. Everywhere she went, she would take the doll. The doll was almost as large as she was. When you look at all of their dolls, yeah. some have natural, some have straight hair. Yeah. And it just depends because African American come in different complexions. So that's why you have different complexions on all of the dolls. Yeah, people are different and yes. dolls can be different and too. And dolls can be different wow. too. This doll right here looks a little familiar. That's another baby Nancy. Same, same as the, the baby same, Nancy back there. That's correct. They made two baby Nancys, one with short hair and one with long hair. Oh, she does have long hair. And then I see there's some writing here. It says 1968 Shindana, and it's Division of Operation Bootstrap Incorporated USA. And that's correct. That was the company that was formed, and Shindana was actually a subdivision of Operation Bootstrap. Got it. 
She revolutionized the toy, the American toy industry. So what do you mean by that exactly? Baby Nancy actually had features of African Americans. Yeah. If you look at her face, the mouth, the nose, the jaws. She just looked like an African-American kid. And dolls before Shindana, what did they look like? They were just dipped in chocolate or color. So they took a white doll. And, and they... just changed the color of the doll. Oh, well that doesn't seem appropriate. No. No. So why was it important for you to get Shindana dolls for your kids? It's a positive image for them. Right. So it was important for me to give my children things that look like them. I had to find out more about the company behind the dolls. So I headed to the Southern California Library, a true community archive. Hey, Michelle, it's good to see you again. Good to see you. Specializing in histories of community resistance, the library's vast collections preserve stories that aren't always woven into LA's official history. Here you go. Space Century Organizational Files. So I wasn't surprised to find an archival folder thick with materials about Operation Bootstrap, news articles, and ephemera about a groundbreaking community empowerment program that much of Los Angeles has forgotten. Stories of a war-torn community rebuilding itself with vocational training, outside investment, and entrepreneurial initiative. Most narratives of the aftermath of the Watts Uprising emphasize how businesses fled the community. But these documents suggest that's not the whole story. Not even close. Outside LA's black community, the Operation Bootstrap story is barely known. How did it start, and why was a toy factory at the heart of it? For answers, I went to the Dunbar Hotel, long the heart of Black Los Angeles. It stands less than 100 yards from where Operation Bootstrap set up its headquarters. There I sat down with Marva Smith, whose late husband Lou Smith founded Operation Bootstrap, and David Crittenden, a friend of the Smith family and another leading civil rights activist. So I just came from the Southern California Library and okay. um, just recently was told about Operation Bootstrap. And I think it's just a fascinating and really important part of LA history that more Angelinos need to know about. Uh, at the library, there were these uh, archival materials on uh, Bootstrap. This is one of the pieces that helped to say, hey, we're here to the community, you know, come join us. Yeah. And this is your, uh, your late husband, Lou Smith. Yes. He ran everything. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, he's the person who interacted with businesses and community people and tried to bring them in to the idea of a job training center that we wanted to open. We wanted to involve as many people in the community, particularly young people, in advancing their own careers. This was the slogan of Operation Bootstrap, right? Learn, baby, learn? Yes. So where did that come from? Shortly before Operation Bootstrap was opened up, there was the uprising in, in Watts. And the slogan there was, burn, baby, burn. Burn, baby, burn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We took that and made it into a more positive thing. Learn, baby, learn. That, that sort of summed up the attitude uh, of Operation Bootstrap. Yeah, it, was, it summed up the attitude of uh, Lou Smith and Robert Hall. Both of them were very uh, savvy political people. Lou Smith was a national figure because he came from Congress of Racial Equality in New York City. We met during Freedom Summer in 1964 uh, in Mississippi. I'd just gotten pulled into the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. He was somebody who had actually come up through the ranks of the, of the civil rights movement, and he had learned from it. Uh, he was always looking for ways to do something about the racial impasse into, in America, the whole, yeah. I, the whole idea of, of uh, racism in America and what to do. What is a black person to do about it? We're talking about how people relate to each other. To us as blacks, it's important. So, yeah, as, as far as opening blacks up to the technological world that they haven't been involved in, yes, that's our job to show in cats that there's better ways to use their talent than hustling on the corner. Yes, that's our job. And so this is an important point that 
Operation Bootstrap, of course, is an LA story, but it's not just an LA story. It's yeah. part of this larger national uh, struggle for civil rights and empowerment. Part of the hope of the civil rights movement was that the power and the commitment and the, the knowledge that was gained in the Southern movement could be transferred into the, into the North. Lou Smith brought that knowledge here. What was this area like then, right after 1965? It just felt like a neighborhood that was crying out for help. It wasn't a pleasant place to be. In the post-rebellion stage, you know, just how do we start out of these ashes? How do we get the locomotion? How do we get the push forward in terms of how do we draw people in yeah. to support this idea? to be able to feed and finance, yeah. because Bootstrap itself was largely made up of ideas that came from the community. Once the community started trusting mm -hmm. Bootstrap, Lou and Robert welcomed people who'd walk in off the street and say, oh, I want to start some business idea, or, mm -hmm. and they'd be encouraged mm -hmm. to do it. Just like, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. go for it. Yeah. This can happen. Yeah. Shindana was a huge success story. Absolutely. People who were working within the factory itself were 90% community people. Shindana became an outgrowth of Operation Bootstrap. We wanted to start something that we could feed people into after they had been to the job training center, maybe learning a skill that could be used at Shindana. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of different businesses yes. under the Operation Bootstrap umbrella. Though. Yes. Yeah, and a lot of it was tied to the outreach that started coming into Bootstrap once it was established. Okay. And then it started getting good press. Mm -hmm. It started getting noticed. And uh, it attracted a lot of people from all across the city, city. with mm -hmm. skills that uh, were quite uh, amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, they said something is happening here that uh, I think wasn't expected to happen, being able yeah, to course. really walk the walk. Uh, mm -hmm. It really paid off. Mm -hmm. Operation Bootstrap shut down a long time ago now, but wh yeah. what's the legacy of it today? There are people who interacted with Operation Bootstrap and our various businesses and fundraising groups and so forth who still feel, you know, uh, that something good had happened to them as well as the community. So it uh, changed them. Yeah, and uh, they'll never forget it the community started to drift in slowly but surely. You know, it took a while, but it happened, you know, and once it did happen, uh, it was the best. It was wonderful, mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, Operation Bootstrap was much more than a toy company. It also owned and operated a body shop, teaching community members valuable job-related skills. And it hosted a series of provocative sensitivity sessions that brought together black Angelinos from South Los Angeles and white Angelinos from the West Side. You can say that this is a generalization, but all white people are responsible for the position that the black man is in today in this country. And once you look at that and you look at it realistically, then you'll be able to rectify the problem properly. And until you deal with the whites should join the revolution. I'm saying that whites should join the John Brown School. And if you're not familiar with John Brown, he was a hunky, a white cat in the abolitionist movement. He believed in the dignity of black people. He believed that black people should have liberation. He believed that no people should impose or infringe their beliefs and their rights on other people. And this cat was willing to die. You know, I have a new definition of racism for me that I didn't have before. Before I started coming to Bootstrap, I used to think that the problem was bigots elsewhere, and that it was outside me, at least. And a racist to me now has become something else. It's sort of someone who watches in this country discrimination, prejudice, uh, murder in a sense, the murdering of spirits, and stands idly by and does nothing about it. Anybody who accepts that system and does nothing to change it is a racist. And one of the things that I've learned that I didn't know before is that I belong to that group. This is one of the things that upset me. The more I listen to the conversations in this room, the more I understand black power, black militancy, the and, and the revolution. One of the high points in Bootstrap came when we were putting training, experience, and making money all together in one bag. 
and opened boot strings. Our dress shop at the border of the black area. I'm manager of the dress shop. Trying to build this one up so that eventually we can go into a chain of dress shops where we're going to sell the authentic African clothing. The Negro Women Designer Association has donated their services to Bootstrap. The sales are real good. We're steadily going up. Operation Bootstrap's dress shop closed long ago, but its spirit is alive and well today at the Irie Vibes Art Space on South Normandy. Doris Connor, who once designed clothes for Shindana Dolls, and her daughter's Linen Tuesday, shared the legacy of Operation Bootstrap with the community. So you all worked at Shindana, is we that did, right? Yes. Yeah. What What did you do? I was sewing when I was six. You were sewing when you were six. Mm -hmm. My okay. mom put me on a sewing machine, and I sewed baby dolls. I always like to design my own doll clothes anyway. Yeah. Oh, so you were doing the clothes. Yes. Like, okay. Well, we did the dolls as well because we did Flip Wilson, we did JJ, we did Rodney Allen Whippy and they got stuffed and then sewn together. So how did you make these? With your hands? With these, <laughs> yes. yeah. with these hands. With these hands. <laughs> I don't think you could show me, could you? Yeah, I think we can yeah. show you. Yeah, I think we'd love to see, yeah. yeah. She yeah. made the pattern, she picked out the fabric. She also had to sew them together. We'll show you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, you hold on to this. We're going to use her as a sample right here. We're just going to take a couple of measurements off of her. Okay. We're going to make a pattern, cut out some fabric, and okay. make her a new dress. What I'm going to do is measure across her shoulders right here so we know about how big we want her dress. So you're measuring her just as if she were a human being. Mm hmm Okay. Exactly. Same thing. Five inches across her shoulders. Let's go three inches for, for her body. And we'll do 10 inches for her skirt. They had a variety of dolls, but the one I remember the most, uh, my sister has an original baby Nancy doll, and she was uh, she's she was bigger than this, but um, she had long hair, and the dresses we made for her were yellow floral dresses with a lot of lace on it. And so you were at the same time you were doing doll clothes, you were also making clothes Creating for... original mm -hmm. designs. Okay. How old were you when you started working on these dolls? I always say um, when I could walk. Yeah. She said when I got out of diapers. Well, when you... <laughs> okay, I cut this one out so you can use my pattern. Yeah. And you're just gonna lay it on top of your paper. So I cut it here? Yeah. Okay, yep. don't screw up, right? Now okay. make sure well, that the, the scissors at the bottom never leave the table. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're right. gonna open it to stabilize the top when one. you cut. You cut good. <laughs> Thanks. Their organization was called Bootstrap, and uh, large companies, they wanted to put some money into the black community. They taught us um, about working in a larger industry instead of just a, a one-man shop. When you've got a business, you've got other people that you're working with and employing and learning more and more skills. You gotta know about bookkeeping. You gotta know about advertising and all of these things. And all of this came from Bootstrap and being a part of Shindana Toys. Okay. Just cut it here. So was there a message you were trying to convey with the clothing when you were working on the Shindana dolls? We just want to make sure that we uplift our culture, yeah. uplift our people, you yeah. know? So we just wanted to show glamour and beauty. So the dolls were authentic then? Yes. Here is something else too, is that it's an opportunity to grow, to expand, to use your creative juices, to do more, to reach farther than you've ever done before. It wasn't just a business then. It was, there was educational. A lot more to it. Yeah. Well, yes, most yeah. definitely. You're doing good. Okay, a couple more. All right. All right, and then I cut out the bottom of her skirt, this part right here, and I'm just going to give you half of mine. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Let's go sew. Okay. What 
Look at you. You so? I'm doing okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's the most important thing is to sew a straight line. You're all good. Okay. Okay. And now do that thing. Mm-hmm. Do that up. thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to pin the front and the back or both ends and make sure all the gathers fit in the middle. Then go ahead and pin Just it. Just pin it. Mm-hmm. Try not to prick myself. Yeah. Uh -huh. Each time you sew, it gets easier and easier. Right. But practice makes perfect. Right. It's probably yeah. better to start with a doll's dress, right, than a full size. Well, that's how we yeah. started. Yeah. I remember taking mom's scraps of fabric and making, you know, my own, my baby doll dresses. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> you can check this off your bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're this has been so much fun. Yeah. Now, the joy this would bring a little girl that mm. possibly dresses like this, mm. looks like this. Yeah. It's like, oh, often we don't think that we look beautiful mm. when we look in the mirror because if society says this is beauty and we look in the mirror and we don't look like this, yeah. then we go, She's so pretty. Oh. Yeah. That's what the media was telling you. This is a really powerful counter image. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was one of the goals of Shandana Toys. Yeah. And also yes. my mother with Connor Collection. Well, that's wonderful work. Yeah. yeah. What kind of doll you want? A black. A black. Which one of the black dolls do you want? This one or this one? This one? This one? This one? This one? What kind of doll is this? Who's this? That's baby DB. Can you say that? Here. Which kind do you want? In what way are you like her? Because she's black. Oh, and you're black, huh? So you and your baby are just alike, huh? Operation Bootstrap eventually wound itself down more than three decades ago, but its spirit of community empowerment lives on today across Los Angeles. Perhaps no neighborhood is more at the forefront of the conversation about the importance of Black-owned businesses than Levert Park. I met up with historian Yolanda Hester in this neighborhood to get her perspective on the Operation Bootstrap story. So Shinana definitely changed mm -hmm. the toy market, mm -hmm. but you know, how did it change the business atmosphere here? So what's interesting about Operation Bootstrap is if you look at the history from all of the businesses that came out of it, it's, it would seem very random and difficult to figure out what that through line is. You know, you yeah. have a gas station, you have a clothing store, you have a <laughs> recording studio, you have the yeah. toy factory. But if you look at it from the point of view of the community and the people who help build Operation Bootstrap, what you realize is that these were the types of industries that people knew how to do and they wanted to do when they needed. It. it was a very community-driven effort. Um, and that was very important to lose political uh, mission and political vision. Right. Um, you know, they came into a community that was in some ways looked at as a place of deficit, you know, and they countered that narrative by um, identifying assets in the community, cultivating them, and then leveraging them for the good of the community. And it was yeah. successful. Yeah, the name really was was appropriate. Yeah. Bootstrap. They're yeah. Pulling, yeah, pulling themselves up by the yeah. bootstraps. Yeah. yeah. But and it was a community effort because right. I think oftentimes when people use the term bootstrap, it's a very individual, like, why can't you pull yourself up by your bootstrap? Right. In this case, it wasn't to condemn any particular person. It was really about this community effort and figuring out, well, what do you have? What can you make out of what you have? Right. And when you look at a family like the Connors, mm -hmm. who now there are multiple generations of people engaged in all the creative arts, yeah. you can see that there's this lasting impact, this yep. lasting legacy absolutely. that Bootstrap and Shadana have. Yeah, absolutely. One of the biggest potentials of Bootstrap that's starting to be explored and exploited is it as a vehicle to bring people together. You see, I've kind of gotten away from thinking in terms of power structures and power systems. It's really down to people. Yeah. And Bootstrap has been able to bring people together where 
let's say they can exchange their technology for the soul of this community. This community has soul and very little technological know-how. The outside community has a lot of technological know-how and they've forgotten how to live, how to be human beings. So when we blend these two together, I think it's sort of a nucleus of building a, a whole different type of society, a whole different type of world where people won't be boxed. We can love each other for our differences. In fact, that would be the beauty of this type of society we're trying to build. I'll be honest, I've never been much of a doll guy. And when I started this journey, I was skeptical that a child's toy had much of a story to tell. How wrong I was. The story of baby Nancy only underscores how much history might be hiding in our closets and attics, and how so much meaning can be woven into one little object. The old cliche is true. Big things do come in small packages. LA is made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropy, the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, and the California State Library. <laughs>